Hello and welcome to the broadcast. This is a ministry of North Harford Baptist Church in Jarrettsville, Maryland. Visit us online at northharford.org. Be in Daniel 6. We're skipping our weekly reading from the gospel and our weekly reading from a gospel primer this week because I want to give a lot of time to Daniel 6. I want to give the whole hour to Daniel chapter 6. And I'm calling this class Trust God and Pray Always. And if you know anything about the Daniel story, you, that probably already connects with you why the study would be called that. Trust God and Pray Always. It's the only way forward for the child of God uh, while living in the kingdom of man. It's the only way to persevere, is to trust God and pray always. It's the only way to grow spiritually and not lose hope, is to trust God and pray always. It's the only way to not lose our faith and not give up our confession in the face of adversity and threats from persecutors. Trust God and pray always. To begin, I'll read verses 10 through 13 to highlight this in the chapter, the idea of trusting God and praying always, and then Then we'll pray and we will work through the whole chapter. Daniel 6, beginning in verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, we'll read about that document later, okay. He went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement, that means they were plotting and scheming, and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, didn't you sign the injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast. According to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Trust God and pray always. No matter what the world says, no matter what the enemies of God say, no matter what Maybe hostile family says, trust God and pray always and leave the result to him. Let's pray. Father, help us humble ourselves under your word this evening. Teach us. I pray that you would encourage us. Encourage us to trust you. Teach us more and more deeply what that means. Help us to grow in our prayer lives. Let it begin for each one of us tonight inside the heart with a greater desire and burden and passion to pray to cry out to you, to lay our pleas before you, to pour out our hearts before you, to pour out our requests before you, to say thank you, thank you, God, for all that you've given us, for all that you've done, all that you've promised to do. Help us to be a people of prayer. Help us to commit ourselves to prayer as individuals, as a congregation. Help us commit ourselves to prayer in newer, fresher ways. Father, we pray for a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our day, in our location, that we would see an increased interest in truth and salvation, an increased interest in you. By your providence, by your spirit, through the power of your word, would you make it happen. It's in Christ we pray. Amen. Uh, Trust God and pray always is the topic. It's the only way forward for a child of God while living in the kingdom of man, walking by faith, not by sight. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray continually. Or pray without ceasing. Pray unceasingly. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. As we begin with some meditations on prayer, I think there's really good application just from that one verse. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Why would we need to pray continually? You can come up with a list of reasons. I'll give you three quick ones that came to mind. Well, we we would want to pray continually, and we need to pray continually because we continually have needs that we need to go to God for. We have needs in mind, in heart, in our lives, around us, so we can pray continually, or we must pray continually, because we continually have needs, and at the center of those, spiritual needs. And we know people who continually have needs, so we continually pray. Secondly, 
Why would we need to pray continually? Well, because we continually have things to say thank you, God, for. We have all kinds of things we could say thank you, God, for. We must be a people who are filled with gratitude for all that God has done. That's part of our witness, shining the light of gratitude for what God has done for us and he's doing in us. We must continually pray because we continually have spiritual needs. We know people who continually have spiritual needs. We can intercede for them. And we continually receive things and have things that we should express thanks for. Expressing thanks through prayer is central to the Christian life. And thirdly, why would we pray continually? Because we're continually in a spiritual battle. Am I the only one? I know I'm not the only one. It's rhetorical. We are continually in a spiritual battle continually fighting against temptation, continually fighting against sin, continually fighting to have a better prayer life, continually fighting against discouragement and despondency, continually fighting against distraction, laziness, continually locked in spiritual battle for the name of Christ. So therefore, pray without ceasing. Pray continually. Luke 18, 1, Jesus told them a parable to the point that they should always pray and never lose heart. And then, do you know what parable he tells right after that? He told them a parable to the point that they should always pray and never lose heart. It's the parable of the, starts with a P, persistent widow. The persistent widow. Yes, she kept coming to the judge for justice. Didn't get justice. Kept coming to the judge for justice. Didn't get justice. Came to the judge for justice. Pleading, pleading to the judge. Came back, came back, came back. The judge gave her justice. And the operative verse in the parable is Luke 18, 7. Jesus says, Will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? And the answer is implied, yes, yes. God will answer the cries day and night of his chosen people. We should be persistent, persistent. Psalm 55, 17, one more before we get into Daniel 6. Evening, morning, and noon, I voice my distress and I cry aloud, and he shall hear my cry. Prayer. Trust God and pray always. Pray without ceasing. Always pray and never lose heart. Be like the persistent widow. God will hear your prayers and answer according to his will. Daniel's one good example of that, just in his persistent and faithful prayer, no matter what's going on, no matter what the threat from the kingdom of man. Right, let's begin with uh, verses 1 through 9 in Daniel 6. You will see that, God begins to advance Daniel. He's already done that in different ways. He begins to promote Daniel through his providence, advancing Daniel. But simultaneously, worldly adversaries are plotting against Daniel. Which you have Daniel, the child of God, stuck as he's a citizen of the kingdom of God. He's a believer. And he's going to be faithful to his king, God in heaven. And he has adversaries plotting against him. But you see God working, providentially advancing Daniel while worldly adversaries plot against him. You ever felt like maybe you're in a situation like that? Well, we'll see what happens here. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, sort of like uh, governors, which is regional rulers. And over them, three high officials of whom Daniel was one. As you, he's one of the three high officials, not one of the 120. He's one of the three high officials of the whole kingdom to whom these satraps should give account so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps. And so he's at the top, distinguished leadership because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. Do you see what's happening? He's 
God working through Darius, working in Daniel's life, of course. And the trajectory or the direction is Daniel is going to be set over the entire kingdom. Here come the plotters. Here come the schemers. Here come those who want to work against God's child and against what God is doing. Verse 4, the high officials and satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. What does that mean? It means he wasn't crooked. It means he wasn't corrupt. He was above reproach. They couldn't find anything, a lie, a backroom deal, anything. He was truly a righteous and wise leader. Nice, it's nice to have some leaders like that, right? That's what you want in a leader. And world leaders are accountable to God for their lives, no less than any other person is accountable to their lives. And they will be held to account for the way they lead on earth. Verse 5, then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Aha, they found Daniel's weakness. They know his weakness is that he ha his supreme authority is his God. And they know he's not going to violate, what does it say, the law of his God. Which, so now they have some groundwork from, from which to come up with a plan to trap Daniel, to trick Daniel, because they know that no matter what, Daniel is not going to break covenant faith with his God. They, uh, we find no ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. In other words, they've got to set him up. They've got to set him up. So, what are they going to do? Verses 10, or, or no, no, verse, still going, verse 6. So the, the high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. Well, sometimes flattery will get you everywhere. Right? All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors, the governors, are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance to enforce an injunct injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. So there's their plan. So they want to catch Daniel in violation or in some kind of rebellion, something where he's guilty in the eyes of Darius, in the eyes of that kingdom. So what they're doing is setting, setting him up. They're making it illegal to what? Illegal to pray. That's what they want to do. They must only pray to Darius. Nobody else. Now, O king, establish the injunction. Sign the document. We're talking about legislation here. So that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and the injunction. So now it is illegal for Daniel to pray. He can only, well, it's not illegal for him to pray to who? To Darius. He's free to do that. But it's illegal for him to pray to God. Quite a predicament, one would think. Daniel didn't think twice. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, that's an important verse because we want to make sure that we establish it's not like Daniel doesn't hear about it, and that's why he, he keeps praying as he did. No, he knows. Daniel knows. He's well aware. When Daniel knew that the document was signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber, open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks, gave thanks before his God. Why would he do that? As he had done previously. All right, this was his normal devotion. So that's what he does. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Now they knew where he was going to be. I mean, there's a reason they chose this plan to catch Daniel in prayer. Because they knew he was faithful in prayer. And they knew right where to find him. 
And I don't think they were surprised when they saw Daniel praying, making petition and plea before his God. That is in, you have a nice little paradigm here for prayer. Verse 11, Daniel's making petitions, right? We call them requests, laying our requests before God, petitions and pleas, crying out to God, pleading with God. Back up in verse 10, he's on his knees. It's not necessary to get on your knees in order to pray biblical spirit-led prayers, but sometimes the physical posture can help. It can help to focus. Uh, it's, it's common, it's normal to get distracted while praying. Right? The flesh doesn't stop fighting against the spirit when we're praying. In some, way, in some ways, the flesh fights even harder. Our pride fights and our selfishness fights even harder while we're trying to get praying. So the physical posture, for instance, closing eyes, right? It's meant to help us zone out tune out things around us and focus. Falling on our face can help that. Getting down on knees can help with that physical posture. And it says he gave thanks. He prayed and gave thanks. So he's giving thanks. He's on his knees. He's making petitions and requests. He's making pleas to God. Verse 12. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, didn't you sign the injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? And the king answered, well, they really didn't want Daniel around. You know, they could have just, let's, ha let's have them be exiled, have them be put in prison, have, them, have their position be taken away. No, 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 let's have them killed. Let's have them executed painfully, horribly. Uh, the jealousy, the corruption, this well, part of the irony here, right? You see the difference in how the kingdom of man operates and how children of God operate. It's different kingdoms, different spirit behind it. The king answered and said, These things stand fast according to the law of Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Because what kind of king would he be when back on his own word, right? And uh, it wouldn't be good for him. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Boom, they got what they wanted. Now they have an accusation. Right? So they were right. For wicked, rebellious, God-hating, corrupt um, magistrates, their plan worked. You might think. But anyway, they knew how to get Daniel. Right? They were right about his faith. Daniel had a good witness. They knew he wouldn't break faith, and he didn't break faith. And so they had a plan that would get him. Verse, verse 14. And then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. So his, his throne, his authority, his power, his position is at stake. What kind of king? They're not going to want him as king if he violates his word, think, breaks the law of the Medes and Persians that he himself signed into signed into law. Then the king commanded, verse 16, then the king commanded and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, may your king, or may your God, well it is Daniel's king, his God is his king, may your God, whom you serve continually, well, that's a, I think that's a powerful phrase for the way we think about our lives. Right? We do not just serve God in this little sphere of life called church. We serve him continually. We serve him at work. We serve him at home. We serve him at school. We serve him in the public square. We serve him with how we vote. We serve him for our participation in every sphere of society. We serve God continually. 
Darius says, may your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. It was basically just locked in there, sealed in there, place of death. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions or no distractions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. The king liked Daniel. Daniel was a good leader. Daniel was trustworthy. Daniel had wisdom. Daniel had knowledge. Daniel was respectable. He was not corrupt. And the king's really torn up about this. Verse 19. Then at the break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? And Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel, same exact uh, thing you saw back when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the furnace. God sent his angel. Verse 22, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths. They have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. I trust God and pray no matter what. Serve him continually. Don't break faith because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, verse 24, the king commanded and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions. And here comes God's judgment. In providence, God redeems his people and preserves his people and in providence, he brings judgment against the adversary according to his purpose. Many of God's adversaries in this world um, won't face a, 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 such a providential judgment in this world. They'll face a final judgment, of course. But you do, do see these throughout redemptive history, God intervenes and brings judgment at appropriate times. And the king commanded those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions. They, their children, and their wives and before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Right. We're, su we're supposed to know, we're, we need to know that it wasn't as if the lions for some reason weren't hungry or were sick or weak. Right? There's no natural explanation for this, which is what man would want to do, some kind of natural explanation. You know, the lions were ready to go. But an angel came. This was a supernatural deliverance, just like in the fiery furnace. Do you really need to say fiery furnace, right? The furnace, the super hot, hyper fiery furnace that was, that was turned up to be as hot as possible. Um, it was a supernatural deliverance. And this was the same thing. It was a supernatural deliverance. This is a historical judgment on the enemies of God and of God's people. Verse 25, we'll see a recognition of God's authority. Then King Darius wrote to all peoples, all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Right, so his, his kingdom. Remember Nebuchadnezzar did something, had an epistle too in here. He wrote a letter acknowledging God's power and God's authority as God revealed that to him. Darius, the same thing. He wrote to all peoples, nations, languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, in other words, in my kingdom, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion sh shall be to the end. It takes us right, everything always points back to that central prophecy of Daniel 2, 
where God is going to come and establish his kingdom on earth. In the, from his perspective, in the future, in the days of the fourth kingdom, the Roman Empire, God is going to establish his kingdom. But what does he do from, from, that, from this point here in Daniel to that point when Christ comes to do this? He gives signs and tokens of the promise that God is the living God. He endures forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed. His dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues, verse 27. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Both, both locations, in the invisible realm, in the visible realm, in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. You know, we're on any section of Daniel, there's one of really one of two things you could study out. With the, filling in details, of course, different situations and different things happen. It's not the same same exact thing over and over. But the major themes are the same. Number one, God's sovereignty or his sovereign rule, his providence, he's working out his plan, right? Or, so that's from the heavenly perspective, just focusing on God and how he's the king and he's the ruler and he's doing what he wants to do and he's revealing his plan. He's giving nightmares to Nebuchadnezzar, right? And the writing on the wall, he sent the hand to write on the wall in front of Belshazzar. Um, the other thing you can study is from man's perspective. Look at the people of God in the midst of these situations is one way to look at it from man's perspective. Right? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, their faith, their faithfulness and how God delivers them. Daniel, his faith, his trust. How does he exist in exile as a child of God in this wicked kingdom? So from the perspective of man, you could look at from the people of God or the kingdom, the kingdom of man. You could look at the king. And you could look at these lost people warring so to speak i mean it's it's futile right we know this it's futile warring against what god is trying to do I mean, they cannot stop him god is not just doing arbitrary things right? he's working out a purpose he has a people he's preserving his people he's preserving a faithful remnant of his people because it's through this nation through this people that the redeemer will come and save the world god is doing something these aren't just abstract theological lessons He's revealing his power and his redemption and his judgment and his righteousness because it's his earth. And that's what he's purposed to do. And again, it's all leading up to that day when Christ comes and establishes the kingdom, which is a, it's a spiritual kingdom. And you have these beasts that in the eyes of the adversary, uh, they want to destroy Daniel. Of course they want that, right? That's not up for debate. They want Daniel to die. Well, you find out in chapter 7, throughout the rest of the whole Bible, through prophetic imagery, what the real beast is. What the real menace, disgusting, fierce, killing, beastly creature on earth is. It's the fallen kingdoms of man. The kingdoms of man are likened to destroying beasts. And that imagery will, you know, will comes in Daniel 7, but that goes throughout. You see that in the book of Revelation also. You know, satanically driven, uh, unrighteous, wicked, sprawling, evil kingdoms. So there's Daniel 6. In the midst of it all, Daniel's trusting God and praying always. And the only way, that is the only way forward for children of God in this fallen world. Right? Living in the kingdom of man. I have uh, the rest of the class devoted to some prayer helps and meditations on prayer. But uh, before we get there, I want to stop for any questions or insights from you. And then uh, don't let me forget, I, wanna, I want to revisit this diagram from last week. And I want to add a component to it that connects. Yeah. Uh, 
No, I don't think so. I mean, there are people of God are meant to be in Jerusalem. Right now, they're in this unnatural exile because they're under judgment. So his heart is longing to the place where they're supposed to be. That's supposed to be the city of God. That's supposed to be the kingdom of God. Israel centered on Jerusalem. So. Yeah, but in a, in a real abundant sense, that's true. Whether that's Jesus or anyone, I don't just don't see any reason. I don't think so. I mean, if you find it, what I'm saying, I don't, I don't see it, that it would be a command in the law because the law is meant for the in the land. I mean, that that actual land was that kingdom. Of course, it's a typological kingdom. It's an earthly kingdom that looks forward to heaven, the kingdom of heaven. Uh, but I could be wrong about that. If anyone finds a cross reference where that's commanded, uh, let me know. Don, do you ever say something? Yeah, he was pressured into it like Pilate. Yeah, but he wasn't. He was still the king, even though he was about to go under arrest. Yeah. So it was just out of the decision. So I guess the the question I have is why why should we have to choose between these two major kingdoms? Why mm-hmm. knowing the Lord, the glory of the Lord, but the man of God and the right hand of God? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. He definitely doesn't want an uprising. He doesn't want a rebellion. You know, you want you want peace in the kingdom. You you know, you want to keep people happy from a worldly perspective. And so and, and the same thing for Pontius Pilate. You know, he uh he made Yeah, and it's interesting. You even see uh in the way he talks and in the way he approaches, you know, the next morning that there was some kind of category where he thought it was a possibility that God would save Daniel. So and he, you know, so he went and he ran and he was hoping and hoping and God did save Daniel. But, yeah, he's not off the hook for his sin. Um, but that's part of the treachery here. I heard voices coming from over this direction. That's a great point. Yeah. Daniel was a high official. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's corruption. But you're probably right. I mean, they're not going they know that the king loves Daniel, at least from a leadership perspective. So uh, they're not going to go up to him now. Listen, we know you love him, but we hate him, and here's what we want to do. So they're definitely lying, scheming. I mean, it's twisted stuff. And I probably right. I, I think there's an element of that there, um, where they made it like this this really good political move. Um, yeah, he played to his ego, did all the right stuff. Yep. Well, the, yeah, so for those who can't hear, um, if it seems, it was said that it seems that the implication is if you trust God, he'll deliver you. And I would say in an ultimate sense, in a principled sense, yes. He won't always deliver you in a supernatural providence like this. That's nowhere promised. That happens in special times and, you know, throughout redemptive history. 
but that's like we're not promised that God's going to reveal himself to us in a burning bush just because he revealed himself to Moses in a burning bush, things like that. So there are unique instances, and that's why they made it into the book, right? But the principle, absolutely, he will deliver us no matter what. Um, Christ was vindicated as he, as he passed through suffering and death, bearing the sins of his people. And it's through many tribulations that we'll enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, many, but we will be vindicated in the end. And what did we say before class? We were just, some of us were talking. This life is just a vapor, right? And when we die and move on from these mortal bodies and we enter into the presence of God, then we'll finally, we'll, you know, I don't want to say fully comprehend, but we'll finally get, you know, what that really means that that life we just left on earth was just a vapor. It was just a snap. When we walk into eternity, that'll be made clear. So, yes, God will deliver us. He'll deliver those who trust in him. I'm going to say one more thing on that. I think there are some more hands out there. Um, but it's not on the virtue or foundation of, of, uh, of our trusting. It's on the virtue and foundation of his grace and his power. Because where did we get our faith? From his grace and power. It's all founded on God. And, of course, we receive his grace by faith. But it's, it's founded on God's faithfulness, ultimately. Yes, uh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, from the sin cursed world, aka mess. Yeah. All right, so now we have homework. Let's follow up on this. And Psalm 5 7. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah, Jerusalem, and then at the center of that, the temple, and the center of that, where the ark was supposed to be the Holy of Holies, that represented um, where God ruled over them in terms of, you know, the, the, the earthly type and shadow. Um, so it, it was about their covenant relationship with their covenant Lord who saved them, redeemed them, made them into a kingdom, a kingdom of priests, but they came under judgment for their sin and were exiled. But, you know, for the faithful, God was still their king. That was still the capital of the, of the, kingdom, of, the kingdom of God in Israel. And uh, so it would make sense that they would, it's not, I want to say it's, you know, not, ab I was going to say it's not about the location, right? And absolutely, you know, it's not, it's about what it represents. But it is about the location because the nature of the kingdom of Israel was typological. It was that land God promised. It was that land God gave them. That's where the temple was built, and so it, it was important. All right, let's, let's go on to these uh, crazy illustrations from last week. Uh, I just want to add, I've been mentioning it a lot tonight, the uh, nature of the kingdom of Israel, and then all throughout we've been talking about the kingdom of God that would be established in Christ's coming. And one is a type and shadow of the other. This, these diagrams last week represented God as king. Right? That's a crown that represents his sovereign rule over all things. And we can call that his, uh, his providential reign or his providential kingdom. We'll call it a providential kingdom. He reigns over all things. And I'm going to get rid of these cross hatchings just to make it a little easier to see. The whole earth is his, and the fullness thereof, and all who dwell in it are under his authority. It's his earth. Everything in it is his. He has rights on all things, as a friend of mine says. 
his providential kingdom. And then within, within that kingdom, within that realm of sovereign rule, God establishes an elect kingdom. The kingdom of Israel. Now, the full significance of that we're not going to be able to get into, but this was an answer to his promise to Abraham that he was going to, and that follows, that advances and follows on the promise from Genesis 3.15, God's going to send a redeemer. Uh, So we're not going to get into all the details, but you know that this happens. God enters into a covenant arrangement with Israel. The only thing I want to highlight right now is that these are two different aspects of God's kingdom, or of God's rule on earth, his providential kingdom over all things, and his elect people. You could call it a kingdom of redemption. This is where the redeemed people are. Not everyone who was a citizen in the earthly nation was a, re- was a redeemed child of God. But the purpose of this is redemptive purpose. Now, after Christ comes, and he comes, you know, from heaven, right, from this nation, dies on the cross for the sins of his people, is buried, is risen, teaches about the kingdom of God, and ascends back into heaven, right, as a man, well, he ascends over here. <laughs> the right hand of the Father, right, which is, uh, you know, it's a metaphor for he shares the authority of God. Right, so now you have Christ as reigning with the authority of God, which is new. There was not a man reigning in heaven at the right hand of God before Christ came as the Redeemer, in fulfillment of God's promises, and accomplished salvation. But now there is. It's King of kings, Lord of lords. And now, the outward manifestation, or the outward organization of God's redemptive kingdom is different. Now you don't have an earthly nation. Now what do you have? Yeah, but just the outward manifestation. Don't overthink it. The outward manifestation of God's redeemed people, what do you have? Local churches. Yeah, you have churches. Now, they started. They did start. See, this is Israel. This is the Jerusalem. They started there, and they've been spreading in obedience to the Great Commission ever since. This is not a earthly typological kingdom this is you know a kingdom its power is manifest on earth and a kingdom its power is advancing on earth and having an impact on earth the outward organization or the manifestation is local churches scattered in all nations but you still have the main difference i mean you would just need you would need all i mean how many lines would you need to come down for all the, all the churches all over the world. But you still have the distinction of, of God's providential reign over all things. That just hasn't changed. God has not stopped being the providential king over all of the earth. Only now that's mediated through Christ. That's why the kingdom of the weeds, the world, is Christ's kingdom. And the parable of the net. Very clearly, and we studied that a couple weeks ago. The world is his kingdom in one sense. That doesn't mean his redemptive kingdom. There's still still wicked kingdoms of man out there in the world. We know this, right? His redemptive kingdom is organized in biblical local churches scattered all over. Now, now as I back up and look at the the diagrams, you know, maybe you'd say, well, that looks ridiculous. But hopefully we see there's just two simple things I'm trying to get across. Well, three. One is the difference between God's providential kingdom and, and then his, his elect, his redemptive kingdom. That's one difference. The second difference is the difference between the typological kingdom of the old covenant that was under law and the eschatological local church arrangement of the kingdom now, which is a, it's, it's a heavenly fulfillment of an earthly type and shadow manifest in local churches. 
And the third and essential difference is now, whereas in his saving work, the eternal Son of God became man, lived on earth. Now you have a man who ascended to heaven to reign as God. And that's who we worship. We worship the living Christ, God and man, man and God, reigning in heaven with the authority of God, saving a people for himself, advancing his kingdom through the gospel, through local churches, biblical, spirit-filled local churches. So now we could just say, okay, well, therefore, how important is the church? Right? Should it really be so low on, on our priority list and as like this add-on to life? No, it should be everything. I mean, it, sh- it should be everything for us. I have, to, I, have to, I have a new clock in the back. I have to get used to not looking down there. I look there, my clock is gone. It's up there. <laughs> now, Daniel, in the, t- in the time of the exile, Daniel would have been like over there somewhere, right, looking, <laughs> looking to Jerusalem. So he would have been in exile. All right, let's, let's talk about prayer. Is that okay? Remember, the point, at least the practical application point I wanted to bring out for us is that we should trust God and pray always. And I believe that you are like me in that you need to grow in your prayer life, and you're also like me in that you want to grow in your prayer life. And I'm guessing you're also like me in that you've tried and often failed. But over the long haul, if you're honest, God has given you growth. The Word of God is powerful. The Word of God transforms, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it, it's going to work rapidly, the way we like things rapidly in our culture of immediacy, in our, this uh, idol of personal comfort and ease that we've adopted. Here's some guiding principles for prayer. First of all, we should be praying in the name of Jesus. We don't need long-winded prayers. In fact, Jesus commands against that. But we must be mindfully praying in the name of Jesus, conscious of the fact that he's the one who mediates our prayers before the throne of God. We get so accustomed to saying, in Jesus' name, amen. We should be accustomed to that. We want to be accustomed to good things. But sometimes we get so accustomed to things like that that we forget about what it means. We should pray in the name of Jesus. John 14, 12 through 14. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, my kingdom works. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. Right? Whatever you ask in my name, I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So this is where this tradition comes from. It's a good tradition. In Jesus' name, amen. So we lift these prayers in Jesus' name, amen. He commanded us to pray in his name, and he's our mediator. He represents us before God. So the only way to pray properly is to pray in Jesus' name. John 16, 23 through 24. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. So we're asking the Father in the name of Jesus. Asking you will receive. And when we pray also, we should, we should always trust in God's goodness and in God's care. Like a little child who's injured and crying out for their parent. Because the parent will take care of them. The parent will help. The parent will carry them inside. The parent will get them a band-aid. The parent will take them to the ER. The parent will get them an ice pack. Trust in God's goodness and care. Now, Matthew 7, 7 through 11, ask, and it will be given to you. Do you believe that? Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. And right away, the flesh starts to, you know, distract us and confuse us. Oh, that means I can ask for anything. God will give it to me. Well, I asked for this last week, and he didn't give me that, so this can't be true. Listen, this is for children of God, right, whose who's, uh, hearts are fixed on learning God's will, doing God's will, praying according to God's will, and want things for God's glory, not selfish, worldly things. 
Right? So let's not rip principles of prayer out of their context and try to make them mean anything we want them to mean. And then when they don't measure up, we say it can't be true. The principle is God gives what we ask. Right? We find what we seek. And he opens doors we knock on. And as always, that's going to be qualified by according to his will, according to his goodness, according to his care. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, right away Jesus starts to address the objections to his voice. Which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? What do you think? What would we say? Son asks for bread to give him a stone. Who's going to do that? No one. Okay. Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? Anybody? No. Verse 11. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So we admit, that, we admit that earthly fathers are good. Oh, of course, yeah. You ask for bread, he's not going to give him a rock. What kind of dad would that be? Give me a break. We get to God, and we act like he, that's exactly what he would do. Yeah, of course God will do that. He would never give me what I want. He'll never give me what I ask for. No, that's the lesson. Asking, it will be given. Seeking, you will find. Knocking, it will be open to you. James 1, 5 through 8. We've got to trust God's goodness and care. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. You picture that, a wave of the sea? It just goes wherever the wind tells it. For that person must not suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. He's double-minded. If he believes God, he doesn't believe God. If he thinks God is, is, will care for him, he doesn't think God will really care for him. He thinks God will answer his prayers, but not really. He's double-minded. He doesn't have faith. Believe, believe. If any of you lacks wisdom, ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given. But let him ask with faith, in faith, with no doubting. So pray in Jesus' name, but pray trusting, believing that God cares for you and is good and will express his goodness in answer to your prayers. He will open doors you knock on and will give you what you're seeking and grant you what you ask. Next, pray seeking and depending on the Holy Spirit's help. I think it's an easy trap to fall into with any of the outward expression of Christianity, but centrally with prayer to just reduce it down to a work of outward religion where I'll do this thing And if I do this thing enough, if I do this thing well enough, then God will respond to this thing that I'm doing. No, God must be active in the thing that we're doing. The Spirit must be driving along our prayer. Just as much as we say true prayer can only happen in the name of Jesus, true prayer can only happen when we're carried along by the Holy Spirit. Jesus mediates our prayers, mediates in our praying up to God. The Holy Spirit is mediated down to us to help us in our praying. Pray seeking and depending on the Holy Spirit's help. Unless we would say that prayer is like the only category of the Christian life where we don't need the Holy Spirit. Like we would never say that. But functionally, practically, and and listen, we know how hard it is to pray consistently. And to pray for a long amount of time. And to keep that going. And to pray focused on God. To be, be drawn deeper into devotion in His Word. We know that that takes effort. That takes work. Spiritual effort. But that's a good thing, not a bad thing. So we must seek the Holy Spirit's help, and we must depend on the Holy Spirit's help. Romans 8, 26, 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But that's often true for me, especially when I'm going through seasons of despondency or just of low spirits and discouragement or lacking energy or something like that or confusion about something that's going on. And in between the time where you pray for wisdom and God actually gives you wisdom, right, there's this chunk of life where you're like, man, I just need help. I don't even know what to pray for. I just know I need help. The Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts, hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So having a prayerful heart will be searched out. 
and the prayers of that heart that, that we're, not even, we're not even able to put into words and articulate will be lifted to God. Prayerfulness, depending on the Holy Spirit's help. Now, all of that requires right, those three things. Right? Praying in the name of Jesus, right? and then number one, then number two, praying, trusting, really trusting in God's goodness and care. And number three, seeking and depending on the Holy Spirit's help in prayer. It's a, it's a means of grace. It's a spiritual devotion. It's a spiritual discipline. It's not just a, uh, it's not merely an act of outward religion that a person does and God shows up later. All of that requires what I'll call number four. It requires remembering God's power and faithfulness. Remember his power and his faithfulness. Remember his goodness and care, absolutely. Remember his power. This is not a weak God. This is not a God with a short arm. This is not a God who's limited by anything outside of himself. We have all kinds of limitations. I mean, we're limited in all kinds of ways, ways we don't even know. God's not limited. We're, he's not dependent on anything outside himself, but he doesn't have to go consult someone else. And now what should I do in this situation? We are, we're dependent on all kinds of things outside of ourselves, air, food, water, whatever, any, everything, anything. Having the right temperature for which to exist. God's not dependent on anything outside himself. Romans 8, 28 through 30. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Now, the only way that can be true is if God is in control of all things. The only way that can be true at all. Right, I'll read it again. We know, that, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Two things have to be true for us to know that. One, God has to be, God has to be in control of all things with no, no power greater than him to be able to stop him from controlling all things that they may be to the good of those who love him. The second thing, there would have to have been some promise from God that for those who love him, all things are coming to their good. Right, we didn't just make that up. God has promised eternal life, eternal life in heaven with God in a resurrection glory. All things are working to that end and nothing can stop it. That's the picture. That's, and that's the context. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be, the son might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. So now we'll look at this chain of redemption. Every single one that he predestined, he called, which means he brought to faith through the gospel message. Everyone he predestined, he also called. So it's not like he predestined um, this many people and then 80% he called. No, all he predestined, he called, and those whom he called, he also justified. The same picture. It's not like he called this many people and then he justified 80%. Those he predestined, he called. Those whom he called, he justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. All those that were predestined will be risen with Christ on the last day. He'll raise them up on the last day. That's the way Jesus said it. God has the power to do it. He has the power to preserve us. He has the power to perfect us. And he has the faithfulness to stay true to his promises that for those who love him, all things are working to good. doesn't mean all things are good. He didn't say that. Paul didn't say all things are good. All things are working to the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And the ultimate good, no matter what happens on this earth, is heavenly communion with God forever as mediated through Christ and the power of the Spirit. I'm going to read one more verse I've got to, got to pick out from this packet for my last minute or so. Uh, I'll, give you some, I'll give you some cross-references for your own study on the need for the Holy Spirit. We touched on that. The need for the Holy Spirit, John 16, 13 through 15. Or really 7 through 15, all right? 7 through 15 of John 16. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18, and 2 Corinthians 4, 
3 through 6, and then John 3, 3. Just really cherry-picking some passages that deal with the work of the Spirit in different events, uh, and how the disciples would need the Spirit to guide them into truth. Right, their preaching and their doctrine on the day of Pentecost and going forward through the book of Acts wasn't because they went and spent a couple weeks in the library and figured all this stuff out. No, God revealed to them by the Spirit gospel truth for the last days. The need for the Holy Spirit is, uh, you know, you could, you could put that as a bullet point under any aspect of the Christian life. And here we're just talking about prayer. You know, one of the traps I fall into, I'm sure you have to, is, is looking to myself to improve my prayer life. That's complete contradiction in terms. That's, that's foolishness. We need to look to God to help us in our prayer life. That's the essence of prayer. Going to God empty-handed, falling on our faces, whether physically or just internally and spiritually, saying, God, I have nothing, but I know you're, I know you're a good God. I know you're my Father in heaven, and you care for me, and you can help me. So, God, I ask for your help, and then we lay out our, our petitions before him. Secret prayer is what Jesus uh, admonishes us to, and I would admonish us to that as well. Build a secret prayer life by depending on the Spirit and seeking the Spirit. You say, well, Daniel didn't do that. Daniel was looking out the window to Jerusalem. Well, if you want to do something similar, that's fine. Just look out the window to Christ in heaven, all right? 